Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for another Modern Wars 2 Speaker Series event. Um, today we're going to, I'll open up with uh, introducing our speaker, um, sh Captain Haver. She'll have some comments and then we'll go to a moderated um, discussion where I get to ask questions. I'll make sure I leave time for you guys to ask questions because I'm sure you have some good questions. Uh, so today we, we're honored to welcome Captain Shave Haver. Uh, from, she graduated the United States Military Academy in 2002. She majored in international legal studies, um, where she then went as an aviation officer. She went to Fort Rucker um, and became an AH-64 Delta pilot. Um, her first duty station at Fort Carson, where she did uh, her XO and her platoon leader time. And then, you know, as we all know, in August of 2015, First Lieutenant Haver graduated alongside Captain Christian Grish from the U.S. Army Ranger School, becoming one of the first two women to ever wear the Ranger tab. Um, she then later went to the Maneuver Captain Career Course in 2016. Um, she volunteered to transfer to infantry, uh, now serving in the 3rd Brigade Combat Team, 82nd Airborne Division, as an assistant operations officer. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Captain Haver and I'll interrogate, I mean, have questions for her shortly thereafter. <laughs> Sounds good, thank you, sir. Uh, so I guess I was here about a year and a half ago and I was very excited to tell all of you that I was gonna stay in aviation and then I was going to take my Ranger tab and to carry that with me um, to help educate uh, my other flyer peers um, on what the ground guys did. Uh, so I am excited to tell you I did change my mind. Uh, it took about 10 months of a deliberation on my part, but going through the career course um, down at Fort Benning uh, and being with my peers who were in the maneuver branches kind of gave me uh, a different perspective um, and uh, helped me choose, I think, the better right um, and move forward and continue to, uh, to look for opportunities down that line. So um, I take uh, a rifle company command uh, in April uh, and I don't think I could be uh, more ecstatic uh, to know that I'm gonna have that opportunity. Uh, so that's kind of where I am at right now, pre-command, pre post-command post course, uh, waiting for the opportunity to, to take command of 140 steely-eyed steely killers. So um, with that, uh, sir, whatever questions you have, fire away. All right, let's do it. Uh, so I'll start off with the easy question. Uh, you know, in August, of 2015, you graduated Ranger School. Uh, can you tell us how you prepared yourself to be a part of that first class? So I think it's important to note that um, being an athletic individual is inherent to being in the military. Um, I think that you, you may know here, uh, you get stove piped into academics and driven into academics, so it takes a little bit more effort to pay attention to the physical aspect of what being a leader in the Army uh, is. Uh, I grew up playing sports, uh, I grew up playing team sports, uh, and then here I had the opportunity to do um, some other things. I was on the, the triathlon team, um, I was on the rock climbing team, and then, yeah. Uh, and then also the strength and conditioning team. So some personal interests, uh, some you know, influence by my team leader at the time when I was a plebe to go be part of the triathlon team. Not only did I gain some um, you know, insight into in what endurance athleticism really is, um, but I found like an appreciation for tackling those things on my own, especially in an environment where your time is completely consumed. So. Um, I carry that with me as a lieutenant uh, when I was uh, stationed first down at Fort Rucker, uh, Alabama at flight school um, and continued to pursue my, my own, uh, I guess, endurance sports. Uh, and then again, when I went to Fort Carson uh, as a platoon leader, uh, I continued to climb and uh, I, my weekends were spent, you know, looking for other, for races and other things, you know, run races, things that got me outdoors, uh, competitive, uh, and to continue to build that endurance base. Um, so my, I guess, my, my lead up to uh, even knowing that this was gonna be an opportunity for me was, was all an endurance uh, background. Um, 
not to say that the strength uh, and conditioning piece, which I got into very heavily here as a cadet, um, didn't matter as much, but the base that I needed uh, once I got to ranger school came from that endurance, um, that, that endurance pursuit. And then uh, once I was at Fort Carson uh, and the ranger program was going to be opened for uh, females to go at, at, initially when it was opened, it was opened as a, um, a, a trial. Uh, they told us we would be able to wear the tab initially, um, but that we uh, weren't able to uh, have the designator and, and whatever else. So to me, I just, I thought it was like, okay, this is going to test my physical ability, uh, my tactical ability. Uh, to do what my peers are being required to do right as they come out of you know their their initial um, basic officer courses um, and so what i did to prepare i knew that as an aviator i hadn't been under load uh, so a rocking was a was a uh, something that i had to focus on uh, and then upper body strength so as a female inherently um, i had to focus uh, on grip and uh, overhead uh, strength uh, and I knew that from my strength training background. And so I focused on pull-ups and doing pull-ups with weight, overhead pressing things, carrying odd objects like water cans and things to get your hands like used to carrying odd things. Um, so that I was, I was working the same uh, muscles that would be comparable to the functional fitness that was gonna be required of me at the school. So knowing how to do that was from asking people, you know, what do you do at ranger school? You know, what, you know, what do you, what are the things, you know, walking long distances, if they, they would say, or carrying your logs, or like just the, the normal, uh, we call it a, a suck fest, whatever it is that you're getting hazed and smoked at, uh, um, just the, the normal uh, muscle fatigue failure, you know, pushing yourself to muscle failure. So those are the things I came up for myself uh, to start training for. Did you train with anybody um, when, before school? Yeah, so at Fort Carson, uh, when they initially uh, published the Aller Act, uh, my uh, division did a, uh, a pre-screening to see who would be interested in going. Um, all of the individuals who did were required to do a, uh, a mini wrap week, essentially, so went through all of the um, initial physical training or trials, excuse me. Uh, to kind of see where we racked and stacked. And from there, the, cha the chains of command that were uh, interested in allowing their women to go um, allowed the females to kind of train together. Uh, so we met, um, I think we were allowed to meet, I think twice a week. And we did, we focused mostly on just the run, the running, so to get the five miles in 40 minutes and uh, the ruck marching, just spending time under load, which we were not used to. And we did that with the male, um, uh, individuals who also participated in this OML with us because we were all going to go to the same ranger class. Um, they were all part of that uh, that training. So if and there are probably cadets in the class that know that they are going to ranger school, what's the advice um, for them? So f physically I would say if you uh, you're you're going to spend a lot of time underneath a ruck and it'll start off the lightest you'll be is in your first phase and the way that they have you carry your equipment and spread it between your squad um, is lighter, but each phase it'll be more stuff and longer walks. Um, so doing things that are really hard prior to going and doing this really hard thing uh, is probably going to set you up mentally um, for success. So physically, you can train all you want. You can do all the strength training that you want. Uh, you can ruck march for days. Uh, but if you, haven't, if you haven't prepared your mind in the right way, um, that's going to be probably the most difficult thing for you. So my, my advice um, and the things that I tried to do is, OK, what, what are some really hard physical things that take a lot of time um, that I've never done before? So running a marathon or something like that. Just pick a goal. Pick something uh, that's hard to you. Um, that you know that in your mind you're like, man, I, would, I don't know if I can do that. Do it. So that when you get to the point uh, in ranger school, which you will, and you're like, I can't do it. You're like, eh, I've done something else before. I've, I've pushed my mind beyond something else before. And then just don't quit. That's right. All right. That's, that's great. Um, so let's, day one, uh, what was ranger school like for you? Uh, day one. 
you do a lot of in processing and then you sleep in a barracks. Well, they attempt to put you in a barracks so that you can sleep before you take your PT test. They're not allowed to mess with you uh, or anything until after the initial PT test. So it's like very unnerving because you know like the RIs are like walking around, ready to chomp at the bit. They just can't yet, they're not unleashed yet. Uh, so you're like laying in this bunk and like people are snoring, lots of weird noises. And for me, all I was thinking about was the next thing that I had to do, and the very next thing I had to do was push-ups, 49 push-ups. And in my head, I kept on counting to 49 like a crazy person, um, and visualizing myself doing 49 of the most perfect push-ups I could possibly do um, until the next morning where I performed my 49 push-ups and had to move on to the next thing, uh, the next event. So uh, for me, the first day was the mental game, and I knew I had to prepare myself mentally to, to take one thing at a time uh, and do every single event like it was the last chance, last opportunity I was going to get to do it uh, because I knew that that's what I needed to squeeze out that extra juice and to, uh, to not give up on myself. Okay. What's the rest of it? The rest of Ranger School? Yeah. I mean, the story of Ranger School is you just don't, you just don't quit. Um, I think that the most difficult thing for me uh, was not recycling the first phase three times, um, which caused me to spend 124 days in a 62-day course. Um, but once I got to Florida, Florida phase, um, all of my peers that I had been going through ranger school with up till that point um, something something crazy happens to you in Florida. It's like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and so everyone starts to kind of like freak out because uh, they want to be perfect. They don't want to mess anything up, um, and it really is a team sport. In Ranger School, you're not the one that's going to get your tab. Your guys are going to get your tab for you, and so it's about leadership, and uh, it's uh, it's a it's an odd animal. It's a weird leadership uh, situation to be in uh, because once guys know or think they know they've gotten a go. It's really hard to keep them in the game. So I struggled with, uh, I think morally, because I was, so, I was so invested, like all of my emotions were invested in this thing to watch people start quitting, uh, like I took very personally. Um, and it, uh, it, was very, it was very difficult. So on top of the fact that I'd already been in that school for forever, my body was broken down, I was hungry and tired, just like everyone else, uh, I now felt emotionally, personally injured that people weren't uh, as excited to be there um, as I was. So you, I mean, it sounds like you deliberately had a very long view of preparing yourself. Was there something that happened in the course that made you say, man, if I would have known that, I would have prepared differently? Um, preparing differently, I think, so everyone focuses on the physical aspect of it. Um, so remembering that it's a mental game and then remembering once you're out of rap week, uh, your, your job is to get a go from everyone else around you. So uh, I spent some time, I spent some time uh, thankfully, because I went to the pre-ranger program down at Fort Benning before I was allowed to go to the ranger, or start the ranger course. Um, I had an idea of, uh, from the ranger handbook and the, the order of movement boards that they brief you and stuff there, what duties and responsibilities were required of me. So I, I studied those. I made sure that I knew those. I know who I'm supposed to take on me on a leader's recon. I know, who I'm, you know what equipment I'm supposed to have in my ORP or with me when I move. Um, tactically, uh, and and taking the time to do that ended up giving me, even though I might not have done it right every single time or whatever, it gave me that like foundation that I needed. So just like at school, you're learning a bunch of foundational things you haven't been able to exercise yet. Um, it's it's good to have that that initial baseline knowledge to take with you, uh, and then get to apply it. So you might mess it up the first couple of times, um, but it's there. It's in the back of your mind to reference. Um, and to, to actually help everyone else. So, as you know, as somebody preparing to go to a running school, a lot of people have advice. Was there any types of advice that people gave you, either as a ranger student or as the first female ranger student, um, that you say that if they get, don't listen to? Oh, if they get, don't listen to? No, you'll be told, like, you're an officer, so do the op orders every single time. Uh, that is definitely a way to help out your peers because you understand it a lot more than a private or a specialist who's going through with you. Um, uh, there are, I guess, advice no, uh, not to take. 
I think if you're given the advice to, uh, to take it easy on your day off, then that's probably the wrong answer. There's going to be lots of times when uh, you may have gotten your go, um, and so you would like to just be a rifleman and hang out and uh, just walk the lane. Um, but your buddy, uh, who's in a leadership position, you know, could probably benefit a whole lot more from you being the RTO or being right there next to him, um, helping him out. It's going to be really hard to force yourself into those positions, those situations, to actually continue to help when it's not your turn. Um, but I would say that it'll benefit it'll benefit you in the long game because you travel together with these guys whenever you you go on to the next phase. Um, but again, Ranger School is a blip in time to your career, and you'll learn the most, and people will remember the most, and you'll influence the most while you're there. You're coming straight out of Bullock. You're coming straight out of wherever you are here, um, going straight into school, and you're setting an impression of what officers and leaders are. You may not be wearing your rank, but they know they know who you are, and they know if you're going to quit on them, and they know if they can rely on you down the road. What about myths? Any myths you want to help put to bed, either as a Ranger student or as a female integrated into a male dominant squad or platoon? Um, so there, there's a thing called golden walks. It's not always a good thing. Uh, so the myth sometimes with a golden walk is it's, it's typically like the RI's final walk, their last walk with the squad uh, or the platoon. And so uh, sometimes it's a really good thing, like you show up to your ORP and there's cheeseburgers. And then you feel like really weird because you're like, man, if I eat this cheeseburger, I might get kicked out of this school. So I don't know if I should eat this or not. Uh, or it could be really, really bad and everyone, no one gets a go that day because he's on his way out and he feels so inclined to, uh, to make sure he leaves his mark. So I don't know. It, it is a, it's a myth, I guess, that's out there, but it's, it's real. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Sasquatch. All right. All right. I ate the cheeseburger, sir. <laughs> All right, so you, you graduate, uh, a great honor. And of course, there was a lot of media attention afterwards. Mm -hmm. You were even ranked 34th on Fortune Magazine's 2016 list of the world's greatest leaders. How do you feel about being thrust, <laughs> thrust into the national line? Did you expect it, and, and how did you feel about it? I did not expect it, and I got to tell a little bit of the story at lunch today. Um, but my first indicator that uh, something was up was my, when my my father arrived. We'd we'd kind of been corralled off. To, uh, they told us that we were going to do interviews or something like that. But they made it very like clear it's not going to be televised. You know, we can edit whatever you want to edit. Uh, those types of things. I'm like, okay. So my first indicator, though, was my, my mom with my dad. Like, wait, they're, they're saying you're going to be on TV and I'm on an airplane and then I can see you on TV. And I was like, oh, like, I don't, <laughs> this is not good. So, yeah, I was not prepared uh, in the least for that. Um, I understood the weight of what we were doing. I didn't understand what it would change. Um, and I've had the the privilege of being able to have conversations uh, from that point until now uh, about how, whether the inter, you know the integration piece uh, went, how you know my experience was, whether it was at Ranger School or Bullock or however it was, like uh, being involved with like my peers, um, and I think that the the best message that I can continue to say is it's it's all about the the individual that is choosing to do this, and if it, an indiv in a, if a individual is capable of performing whatever standard it is, not taking that opportunity you know, away from them. And how I say it's just like the right person for the right job. Um, so in that, in that moment, uh, I was pretty salty that I got thrusted into that situation, especially as a first lieutenant. Uh, a lot of times I would just get asked questions you know, about big army stuff that I was really frustrated um, that anyone would even ask me that, that I didn't, hadn't proved myself in any way. Um, to be worthy of that, and my peers had done the very same thing that I had done, um, you know, and they weren't they weren't being asked, you know, the questions that I w was about, you know, army, uh, you know, where the army is headed and where we're going, if I think it's right or not, um, and I had a lot of internal, you know, conflict with that too. My initial response when all of you know this stuff happened and like you know combat arms will be opened up and females can go to ranger school, my initial response was like. Good for those girls. They're going to go crush it. You know, I'm over here doing my Apache pilot thing, and I'm, you know, it's not for me. Um, at least I didn't think so. 
Um, so obviously, as I've gone through uh, the past couple of years, um, I've had just some, some awesome experiences to just to be doing what my peers are doing, uh, to that peer leadership aspect, to learn from them, and to be completely supported by my chain of command and my peers. So being an MCCC, uh, you know, coming from all sorts of backgrounds, my peers, you know, come from striker units, from armor units, from light infantry units, airborne units. Um, and we all come together, uh, we all get jostled around, learn the same baseline stuff, we're branch qualified, and we're now sent out to the Army to go command, you know, America's sons and daughters, you know, in, in combat situations is, is what they're expecting us to go do. Um, and I feel like those, regardless of where I started as an as a aviation platoon leader, I was set up for success by the leadership that I received, by the, you know, the individual situational training that I received, the, my decision to go to ranger school um, and decision to go to the maneuver captain's career course uh, gave me like those, those expectations, kind of look forward and okay, this is, this is what's gonna be required of me, this is what we'll, I can, I can do, I've proved to myself and I've proved to others um, by just, by, by applying myself and wanting it, um, and it's worked out so far. So you're about to become the first U.S. female company commander uh, of an infantry company. How did the Army prepare you for that, or how did you prepare yourself for that? So I'm excited to say I will not be the first female infantry company commander. So uh, Captain Kristen Greist took command last year uh, of Bravo uh, 2505. Um, at Fort uh, Bragg, and uh, so when you talk about how do I prepare, uh, she's uh, she's awesome. She's absolutely been uh, sounding board for a lot of stuff and watching how she's gone through and navigated that. But um, the career course, I think, uh, did the the best way of like explaining like training and how you know the very foundational things that you need to know and do uh, as a company commander. Um, but I think uh, as much as I despise saying this, but I spent 12 months on brigade staff as a planner and I don't think anything could have probably prepared me better for uh, what it is the 82nd Airborne Division does um, and our mission set specifically and probably gave me the best insight uh, as to how to perform my duties and what my responsibilities are as a company commander in the unit that I'm in. So would you say Captain Gris just said Let's talk about mentors then. Sure. If, if Captain Gris has been a great aid to you in what you're about to do, sure. have mentors from the beginning been a part of this process mm -hmm. um, or not? Yeah, so uh, I have a theory about mentorship. It's that, you know, you, if you seek out, or you should actively seek out mentors, uh, but it's not their responsibility to continue to mentor you. You kind of owe them something in return, which is, you know, taking their advice, processing it, and, and giving back and continuing to, um, continuing to pursue that, that mentorship. Um, it's, a, it's a give and a take. It's, it takes a lot of time um, and effort for another person to invest in you and uh, to, to put their trust in you, I guess, to, uh, put, their name, to put their name on you. Um, I didn't really think that it was that big of a deal until I got into my situation. Um, and I've had the, the great like, like opportunity to be a mentor to other people um, as well. And so I've started to take it, you know, take a different look at what that actually means. Um, but my mentors, uh, Kristen has been, you know, more like, you know, a peer mentor and being graduating you know, a year before me and kind of leading the way in a lot of the things that we've done over the past two years. Um, it's, it's great that we can have these conversations about uh, whether it's leadership or just, hey, how did you, you know, what system did you use for this? And, um, you know, how did you, what kind of, how did you have these kinds of conversations with your peers or, um, or your soldiers, your first sergeant, those types of things. Um, and then other mentors were, you know, helped me make the decision that I did make to switch into the infantry. Um, which at the end of the day was whether I wanted to uh, command machines or, or people, individuals, personalities. Um, and uh, I felt like my experiences through MCCC and through Ranger School really gave me a perspective that I felt here at the academy, the camaraderie, uh, the teamwork, um, that I wasn't exactly uh, getting from the aviation branch just by the mere fact that it's a very technical and um, 
uh, individual uh, job. When you're in the aircraft, you're managing that aircraft and you know, maybe a couple other helicopters, but um, it's not the same as having you know, a platoon of 40 dudes running around you know, and, and controlling what is the chaos of limited or, or no communication or you know, um, whatever other problem sets arise you know, from, from being on the ground in that way. So um, having someone help me talk so much about being in ranger school and you know, what, what things are motivating you now to continue to be in the Army you know, even after having you know, been thrusted into the limelight, like you said, you know, what makes you want to continue? Um, and that conversation you know, ended up being pr pretty simply just the people. So um, the soldiers are definitely worth it. Do you feel an ownership to be a mentor now? Um, I think so, but it, it is hard um, because you can't be a mentor to everybody. And I don't believe in like, you know, assigning mentors and just because I have a, a female you know, lieutenant maybe that's in my shop, you know, I don't, I don't naively think that I'm now just, you know, I'm responsible for her. Uh, I expect if she wants my advice that she would reach out the same I would with uh, any of my male lieutenants. Um, that's not to, that's, that's a separate from like the developmental piece, which I absolutely own. And whether my lieutenants want it or not, they, they get lots of development uh, from me, so. So I would say that there, there are cadets still, as we have lots of conversation, conversations about integration, they're still apprehensive about choosing that path. Um, I know if you get asked a lot for advice, but you know, if people are making that, you know, cadets are making that personal decision, what kind of advice do you give them? Yeah, it, it's hard because it's twofold. So sometimes, uh, based on your personality, you're like you're very hard on yourself when making like the decision whether to go combat arms or not, because it is very, uh, it's a daunting thing to look at. Um, it's a very specific, uh, dirty, thankless um, job, and you're required to do, you're required to do bad things to bad people, um, and. That, that is not for everyone. But sometimes you're too hard on yourself thinking that you cannot do those things. So you gotta be situationally aware, self-aware, and, and be able to assess, hey, am I, am I doing this because I'm afraid, or if I, am I not doing this because I'm afraid? Uh, or am I not choosing this because I'm not, I'm not, I truly am not able. I'm doing a good self-assessment. Uh, I truly you know, should not be put into this position. And when I have conversations, um, with other females who've chosen, whether they're lieutenants uh, or um, uh, younger enlisted, um, and we have the conversation about why they're doing what they're doing, uh, if I hear anything but, you know, this is this is what I want to do, uh, and I, you know, I'm doing everything I can, even if I'm not, you know, the perfect fit right now, I'm doing everything I can to to get after that. Um, if it's anything other than that, um, it, it's disappointing, just like it would be to ask, you know, any any male. Uh, you know, oh, I just think that this is what ex what's expected of me because I went to West Point, I'm supposed to be an infantry officer. That's the wrong answer. You should own it uh, 100%. If you're not going into the infantry because you truly want to lead men and women to close with and destroy the enemy, which is our job, then you don't need to do that. There are plenty of other opportunities, pl plenty of other jobs uh, to do in the Army that are, are honorable and they're just different. So making that good self-awareness, uh, like making that good litmus test um, before you even do that, um, before you even make the decision uh, is really important. Talk to mentors, talk to your peers, let other people give you feedback, um, but understand that it is a very serious job. Okay, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to the crowd for questions, and if you don't think of questions, then I have more. I wanna make sure you have an opportunity to ask questions that you've been waiting to ask. So there's a microphone, so wait for the microphone to get to you, and not necessarily so we can hear you, but so the recording can capture your voice. Before Bullock? I think it's an awesome opportunity. Um, even, even if you, I don't know what your requirements are, whether you're allowed to recycle or not, um, but just the mere uh, like opportunity to go, you will never experience anything like Ranger School uh, anywhere else. 
uh, and you not even be barracks, you know, like I will compare to the amount of uh, just people getting in your business, telling you that you're not gonna, you know, make it, uh, just like roughing you up, pushing you to your stress red line. Uh, you're not gonna get that anywhere else. And uh, some people say it's a, it's a simulation or it's a stimuli, how you're gonna, you know, respond in combat or whatever, but you probably have never been so stressed out, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, than you will be at Ranger School. Nothing else can really like replicate that. And they kind of have floor into that. So the fact that you get to do that as a cadet and know how you react in those situations, know about yourself, know that you can keep going when you are not sleeping but like 10 minutes a night maybe sometimes or um, you haven't, you know, you're eating your meals really close together or, you know, you're just at your breaking point uh, mentally. Uh, I would have I loved to have had that opportunity. Oh, man, I was thinking more about like after graduation before I board. Um, Is that, a, that's an option? Yeah, they, so, and I think one of the big questions I know with they dilemma is they, they feel that they make a decision, you know, they get, they go on an ML is there's a thought that they should, some of them would use the thought that they want to wait until after they've had the training of IOBC mm -hmm. or the OBC before attempting Ranger School. So Do they kick you out of the branch if you fail Ranger School? No. Then go. <laughs> Get the experience, go. Ma'am, I was wondering if anybody tried to talk you out of going to Ranger School um, and how you responded to that. Yeah, actually, uh, two people. Uh, my warrant officers, because they just didn't understand why I would want to walk around on the ground for a while, because they like to fly. Um, but specifically, so they were, they were telling me some crazy story about them going and uh, like hunting and they had to pack out a bunch of meat. The whatever they had shot was way too big. and. Anyways, they're talking about how heavy their packs were and how uh, how they couldn't possibly how I couldn't have possibly you know rucked out that that like animal with them, and uh, it was super discouraging uh, as they're like talking about uh, you know walking up the, like mountains of Colorado and uh, they probably made the story out to be like way worse than it actually was. Of course, you know they caught a fish that was this big. So, but um, I I was actually I was kind of discouraged uh, in that uh, my father actually too so he was an aviator my entire life uh, also not discouraged me but had me think really really hard about why I was doing what I was doing and assess you know like what the reasons were and uh, I, I know for a fact because uh, being being asked those questions by someone that close to you you know I know for a fact that there were no there were no personal reasons why I would want to go do like this this really crappy thing right this thing that I had no reason to go do otherwise um, other than a, a, a fantastic opportunity. And in my mind, I had convinced myself that uh, it was gonna be something that would make me a better pilot uh, and it would help me train uh, my warrant officers to be better pilots for those guys on the ground. Yep. Oh, sure. Hey, Captain Haver, I'm uh, Major Hartley, Department of Law faculty. Kind of a related question to what just got, got asked. What kind of advice would you give to cadets or lieutenants who are on the receiving end of advice, hey, don't go to ranger school, and, and here's the narrative you're gonna hear. They're part of a branch that doesn't send many people to ranger school, right. and so you get that advice, well, look around at Bullock here, you don't see too many ranger tabs around here, so it, it's not that important. Right. How would you, what, what would you advise them? I think it's absolutely important. At the end of the day, uh, the majority of us will carry around an M4 and are required to go and uh, to be a, a ground maneuver soldier if called to do that. So um, learning the basics, which is what Ranger School is, they, they force you to do the basics the right way and they will beat, you, beat it into you until when you are tired, hungry, and otherwise delusional, uh, that, that you would just do it because it's muscle memory. Um, there is nothing bad that can come out of that uh, for any other branch. Um, and if, you're, if you are given the opportunity uh, and you are capable of, of taking that opportunity, it absolutely gives you a, a better platform to, be, uh, to train those around you, um, to, to not only do those tasks, but it's, it tests your mettle. So it, it's, a, it's a tactical thing, but it's also that 
that mental thing uh, that I was talking, you know, about with him up here. It's just, it's just, it's something that pushes you to your red line that you may, you might never know uh, otherwise. Hey, Captain Haver. Um, I think uh, many people that have been to Ranger School believe uh, earning the tab is the easy part. Bearing it every single day in an infantry unit, in an aviation unit, is a hard part. Um, you've kind of talked about that, but could you talk to that specifically, and then I'll have a follow-up for you. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'll say that <laughs> bear, bearing the tab um, is the is the extended version that that isn't usually talked about, you know, uh, as excitedly. But uh, I hope you hear the excitement in my voice as I talk about uh, being an infantry leader, you know, being a graduate of Ranger School, um, and what that means. Like even you listening to me right now, think that I know what I'm talking about, right? As you stand in front of your platoons, they know that you've been through something hard that they have not and that you've been given just, a, you know, just something different, a little bit you know, extra push, a little bit extra information, a little bit extra tactical expertise um, that gives you that edge, that gives you, um, it, it, it gives you that platform, uh, like I was just discussing, to be a, a better leader and a mentor, uh, whereas you, before, before or without that tab, you may just to them be another person. Uh, and it's not, that is not to say that somebody without a tab is not a good leader. That is absolutely not true. Uh, but given the opportunity, bearing that tab, and what the Ranger Creed says and means, um, it doesn't just, you know, it, it's, it's a tab that you wear. It is something that sets you apart for a reason. Okay, the follow-up. Also, everybody that's been to Ranger School know aspiring aviators, good aviators, bring chow to the Ranger students. So as an a aspiring aviator, did you bring good chow? And knowing what you know now, what have you brought more chow and better chow to, uh, to the Ranger students? And this is really for the aviators in the audience here, so you can give them a little advice for- Yeah, absolutely, any aviators in the room. So they do have chow birds, uh, unofficially, called down in Florida, uh, take pizza or burgers, that's all they want. Can explain why, why you're doing why are they, okay, so they're in flight school, uh, and during flight school they have the opportunity and they have to do the training to go do multi-ship uh, operations, and part of their operation, if, it fall, if a ranger class falls uh, during that time period for them, uh, they get, it's actually an op a good opportunity for them because during flight school you don't really travel with any packs like in your aircraft, so it actually is, being on the receiving end as a ranger student was probably one of the most hilarious and like terrifying things I've ever seen because the aircraft are coming in bucking all over the place and there's like 10 of them they all land at the same time and you're like oh they made it thank god and you know that when you get into this aircraft there's just some glorious pizza or like a McDonald's hamburger like waiting for you um, and they take off and in, in, in route you know they'll they ask us how we're doing and and whatever else gives you a minute to be like a normal person for a little while um, and then same thing on the way into the, the next PZ, you know, bucking all over the place, and uh, so try to be smooth, uh, so they don't throw up what you just gave them. Uh, and as they land, it's just it's you go back into your mode, you get off the aircraft, and they fly away, and it's time to go again. But uh, definitely a good, a, a classic highlight for me. I was like, man, should I tell them I'm here and tell them to save me? I don't know. <laughs> um, but it was uh, it was absolutely a great like little uh, break in the middle of things, sir. Cadet Maddox, Go Army Climbing. Um, my question for you is, Major Spencer spoke to you a bit about um, being thrust into the limelight as a young leader, um, and you've really stayed in that limelight, and we talked earlier about how the cows and firsties have watched you graduate Ranger School and um, begin to take company command. How have you kept yourself grounded um, to make sure that your development as a captain has been authentic? That's a good question, thank you. Uh, so I think part of what I was getting after a, l a little bit earlier is being like too hard on yourself. Uh, I think it would have been, and still is, I have to fight it. Um, I know that people know where I am and what I'm doing. I know that people know what my progress report is and um, people are interested uh, in my career path whereas maybe not you know, the company commander who's taking command beside me. Um, that could be really um, debilitating if I let it. Um, I'm an introvert, 
by nature. So already this whole thing has been, you know, like a stretch to my personality. Um, when I do speaking engagements like this, I'm legitimately exhausted at the end. Um, but the, the role that I step into is like that, is that leader role that we talked about earlier that by, as a cadet, all I wanted to know is what it was like. You know, like I just wanted to be a platoon leader. I'm like, man, when am I gonna get out of here? This is just the job that I wanted to do. And now to me, it's company command. Oh, it's the only thing I wanna do, right? So having someone had come and talked and every time I got the opportunity to hear, you know, just what it was like, it doesn't have to be something phenomenal that I said or like some earth shattering thing. I'm not gonna give you, you know, some great crazy patent speech you're gonna remember for the rest of your life. Like, I just wanna be real with you and I want you to know that, um, you know, I, I, I do, I'm taking this seriously because it's serious to me, not because a general said that I'm paving the way for women in the infantry or the army or whatever, um, but I had to own that on my own. I was really bitter at first when I was thrusted into the limelight with that instance when they were like, no, it will not be tele televised. Absolutely, it was televised. Um, I, felt, I felt completely wronged by that, uh, by the very nature of being an introvert and private person, you know what I mean? So. Um, it took me some. Uh, it took me some maturing to step into. Uh, I think where I am now, which is I can kind of I can separate the um, like the the starstruckness of it um, and the extreme pressure of it. And I see this is my job as a leader. Uh, you're going to be scrutinized whether you are a famous leader or a non-famous leader uh, by your Joes every single day. Uh, God bless them. And uh, it, it, it's your responsibility. So if I can take out all that other stuff and just focus on it like it's, it's my normal day-to-day -day job, um, other captains get to come and talk to you. You get to talk to you know, people who work here every day and you get to hear from their experiences. And I think, if I think about it like that, then it's, that's not so bad. Um, but yeah, I, just, I, want you, I want you guys to know that it doesn't take, you don't have to, I didn't come here and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't some crazy, you know, Already, you know, they deem me this is going to be the first female ranger of the United States Army coming to West Point. I was a scrawny, squirrely little kid when I came here. I was 17 years old. My mom signed my waiver, and I was like, yeah, thank you, Mom, you know, ready to go. <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, it just, I think that every opportunity that I was given to take and, and run with, uh, I surprised myself, and I just didn't, I didn't stop. So as you guys watch me continue to progress, I'll, I'll keep it in mind, but I won't let it, uh, I won't let it destroy me. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, Cadet Oriani, Company B1. So have you experienced uh, any like pushback or suggestion from your peers uh, in terms of different treatment or uh, in terms of Ranger School and then going into the infantry now? Sure. Um, How have you dealt with that? Sure. So I think the only thing at Ranger School, uh, there's this thing they call Manfernos. Uh, it's pretty much when it's cold outside, everybody gets together in a really big huddle, and they call it a Manferno. Uh, they were concerned that I would be upset with that, so they started calling it a Personferno. <laughs> um, I appreciated that, but they didn't have to do that. Uh, and uh, in my current job, outside of the schoolisms, um, I haven't, I honestly haven't had uh, the pushback, uh, and I will go back to every single time. It is about me as an individual, uh, I guess, uh, that uh, I'm, a, I'm a hard worker and I want to be doing this job, and every time I go back to that, I think my peers can see that uh, and know that uh, my, my desire is to be an effective leader uh, and a team player. So whenever I do that on a daily basis, I don't think my, my peers, at least they haven't complained to me thus far about my capability you know, to work alongside them. Um, that those are the things that I, that I focus on. I will say that as a captain, it's a little bit different. My peers are a little bit more mature um, and we've, we've done other things. Um, lots of my peers have deployed or have you know, been in uh, other organizations prior uh, to coming to our situation. Um, I think it's a little different from the, lute from the lieutenants who started off in Bullock together um, are now you know, in their first units together and are experiencing at the, at the platoon level um, the, the stress or maybe the, um, just the challenges of dealing with younger, more immature personalities. Um, so I can't, I can't specifically speak to that until I get down to the company and see what kind of hotheads and you know, 
uh, the individual personalities you know that that I have. Um, but my experience thus far, I have not I have not received the challenge um, that that I think that you're that you're talk, that you're speaking of. Perfect perfect instances, and I, unbeknownst to me, my first sergeant that I will that uh, will be with me in my company um, about a year ago. Uh, he, it was my first interaction with him. And I was going out to platoon live fires to go walk them because I had never walked platoon live fires before. And I go meet my battalion commander, who's my current battalion commander. Um, and they give me a sim brief. They say it's great that I'm out there. Glad that I took the initiative to come out and walk the lanes. And then they're like, now First Sergeant Krill is going to take you to his truck. And I was like, okay. I get to First Sergeant Krill's truck. He's like, ma'am, take off all your gear. <laughs> like, okay. So I start taking off all my gear. He starts just taking stuff off, putting stuff together. Uh, essentially hooking me up because apparently I look like soup just all over the place. It was not to the infantryman's standard. Uh, so I was extremely grateful for that. Uh, he told me to put it back all, all on. He sized it up for me, made sure I was squared away. And he looked, like, he looked at me and said, um, I'd never been taught that before, so I couldn't be held to any type of standard. And now it was my responsibility to make sure that my lieutenants didn't look like that. Um, and then he said I was, he was glad that I was there because he could tell that I cared. And that's huge. And unbeknownst to me, he'll now be my first sergeant, so that's pretty cool. Ma'am, Cadet Hawkins. So going into your company command, not being a platoon leader first, what challenges do you think you're going to face, and how are you preparing yourself for that? So uh, I mentioned it a little bit, but being on brigade staff and being on battalion staff has given me a great opportunity to see all the things that I think I probably uh, just didn't have a firsthand experience in as a lieutenant. Um, I was personally very apprehensive about that deciding to go um, into the infantry and if you had given the opportunity to do it the right way in my opinion um, I would have absolutely loved to have done it that way uh, but the truth is lots of people do voluntary transfer uh, and as well as um, uh, I guess was the branch detail a lot of people do a branch detail um, and it works out just the same. It's based on the individual, you know what I mean? So the jobs that I've been given though leading up to me taking command, I feel, um, I feel as prepared as I could possibly be. Uh, I got to watch brigade level things. Uh, the company that I'm about to take, I'm getting ready to walk their squad live fire, platoon live fire, and then I'll take them to a company live fire. I, I don't think that you could really ask for anything better than that. Sure. All right, uh, all right. So Brigadier General Gillen to calm. So as you look back, <laughs> well, everybody else identified themselves. So, <laughs> as you look back on uh, your time, you know, at one point you were sitting out here, right? You might have been cynical. I hope not. Uh, but some of our firsties claim that their cynicism is starting to wane. But uh, no, as you seriously, as you look back at the academy and your time here, what were a couple of things that? you could offer up that now as you've grown and matured as a leader, sure. regardless of ranger school, but as a leader, what were a couple of things that were your takeaways that you could offer up uh, to our cadets here? Sure, right. yes, sir. Uh, the first, first of all, uh, physical fitness. Um, you will never have the opportunity like you do here to develop yourself. Uh, I wasn't joking when I said I showed up here as like a little scrawny 17 year old. Um, when I, I took every opportunity that I can, uh, I could here to develop myself physically because I knew uh, that was my that was going to be like a struggle for me. And in hindsight, um, I, I wish I could have done more to prepare myself. Um, I don't think I ever struggled, but this is the place where you want to do it. So when you are feeling super cynical, go for a run. Or when you feel like there's you know something like what can I be doing to you know prepare myself better get Figure out what it is that you need to do to, that you're, you just walk into a room, you're going to immediately be based off the way that you look and the way that you act and the way that you showed up at PT and how you performed with your guys. It doesn't matter. And your bullock, it's going to happen. And then when you get to your unit, it's going to happen. So physical fitness is absolutely key. And here you have the time to do that. Um, I'd say the other, the other piece, you're never going to stop leading your peers. Um, you don't have... Uh, real subordinates here as an upperclassman, you, you do, but they're still kind of your peers, you're in an academic setting. Uh, learn how to lead here. And I know that sounds super gen, uh, generic. Um, I even worded it a little bit differently in the MX400 class I was in earlier, but decide what kind of leader you want to be here. Um, 
and not wait until you know your first interaction with your platoon sergeant and he challenges you uh, on the fact that it's his platoon and not yours. What are you going to do? Okay, well I have hard you know I have hard lines already. I've thought through some of these things. Do some rehearsals in your head. Put yourself into uh, start thinking um, about those situations because this is super important. Academics super important. But think about the long game. What are you doing to develop yourself, mature yourself to be a leader specifically? Great. Sure. Um, I think we're about out of time. Um, so we have her schedule packed, but she might have a moment afterwards to uh, talk with you if you want to stop by. Thanks again for coming to another Modern War II speaker event. Be sure to follow our website, nwi.usama.edu, for your daily articles. Uh, to prepare yourself for the future battlefield, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look at that.